Hello and welcome to Irish Football Fan TV. Delighted to be joined by Sheffield United and Ireland International. John Egan. John, firstly, thanks so much for taking the time out to have a chat. Uh, not a bother, Paul. How are you keeping? All good, all good. Good to see you. Yeah, good to see you too, bud. How are you keeping under this uh, c- coronavirus uh, isolation? How are you? I've seen you out with hurls and stuff like that and doing challenges, yeah. but how are you keeping? Uh, trying to keep busy. Like we've, um, To be fair to the, the club, they've given us programmes to work on while we're at home and stuff, so trying to keep busy doing that stuff and you know talking to people on the phone and back home watching netflix um yeah it's tough but uh yeah it's it's uh just trying to keep the brain occupied i suppose yeah well hopefully we'll, we'll help you keep the, br- the brain occupied and uh kind of go back to to your early days um i had darren randolph on the other day we kind of went through his career and kind of his upbringing and stuff like that but do you want to talk us through obviously your dad was uh you know, a Kerry legend and you being the son of him, named after him and everything like that. What was that like with your upbringing uh, coming up as his son? Uh, it was fantastic, really. Um, I suppose coming from Kerry, um, like my, my dad had with the, the kind of football legendary status he had down there. Um, I was kind of exposed to to sport at a young age and you know, I suppose all my summers are spent kind of in Kerry and going to Kerry matches and, you know, you'd see you'd see people pulling in on the side of every road, you know, on the way to a game, you know, wanting to speak to them and stuff. So it was fantastic um, to have that upbringing, really. Um, and I suppose my mum was a Kerry woman as well, so we used to go to every game, um, Kerry football. We used to go down to Sneem and watch So Kerry playing as well in the championship. So it was brilliant. And, uh, you know, any time I get a chance in the summer and stuff, I go back and I'm still reminded of it. I'll always be his son down there. Yeah, I I seen there's a there's a lovely statue. Uh, I seen a picture of your family um, down there. It, it's it's lovely to to go somewhere like that where you know your family is remembered or your father, sorry, is remembered. So far, yeah, it's class. Uh, it's class. Yeah. Um, whenever we go down there as a family, or you know, a few of the buddies come down, we're always getting pictures of the statue and stuff. And to see a statue of my dad in Sneem is is a very proud thing to see. Uh, you know. Obviously, I wish he was around and I wish he could see it himself. Um, but it's it's fantastic for us as a family. And, you know, going down there every summer, uh, yeah, it's it's surreal, really, but it's it's brilliant. Yeah, it's, it's a lovely tribute, to be fair. Um, now, not a lot of people know this because every time anyone associates you, they always associate you with Kerry. But you, you're actually born and bred in Cork. Yeah, I've been born and bred in Cork. Um, lived there up until I moved to England. My dad was a guard in Cork, so he was obviously stationed there. And uh, my mum worked in Cork as well. So, uh, yeah, I was kind of going into school with a Kerry jersey on and everyone else would have their Cork jerseys on. And it was a bit, um, got a bit of stick for it. But uh, anyone asked me where am I from, I just say I'm, I'm probably a Kerry man raised in Cork. Yeah, well, you have your reasons, I suppose, for uh, yeah. for going around in your, in your Kerry top. Um but for you growing up, was was GAA your number one sport, or was was I suppose we we'll call it soccer here? Um, I'd say early on probably GAA, yeah. Um, but to be honest, I suppose from the age of about ten or eleven onwards, I took kind of GAA Gaelic football, football and hurling all kind of similar. You know, I had them all on a similar level. Um, I wouldn't say I had really a favourite. Um. And then obviously the thing started progressing with the with the soccer, football, whatever you want to call it. Uh, we call it soccer back home because we call it football uh, Gaelic. But uh, yeah, as, as soon as that started prog- progressing, I probably took a little bit of a step back from the GA at about 14 or 15 and obviously ended up moving to England. But, you know, and I still love the GA. Um, you know, I'd love to think that maybe someday in the future I'll go back and you know, throw the throw the Bishopstown colours on again for one game with, with the old boys, and uh, you know, I, I still miss it and I still watch it whenever I can. And you know, growing up, it was definitely a huge part of, of my upbringing and my childhood. Yeah, I, I seem to see that with a lot. I know Seamus Coleman is similar with Donny Gall. I think uh, Shane Long as well. Do you, when you meet up with Ireland, do you just chat a lot about GAA and stuff as well? We would, yeah, we'd have um, the odd chat about it. Um, in the September camps, usually one of the All Irelands is on around them camps. Um, so we'd all watch the watch the All Ireland. This year, I was lucky enough 
that we didn't meet up until um, the Sunday night. So I got to go to the game, uh, Kerry Dublin, the draw game. Um, so it was good. So I went into the hotel, dropped my bags, whacked the Kerry jersey on, headed to the game and then got a taxi back from the game back to the hotel. So, um, no, it is it is good like to have the banter and stuff. You'd have the lads from different counties and that. Um, so you would be chatting about it and, yeah, it's good. Yeah, I was actually with the gaffer the night of the replay uh, over in London. They were doing a, a supporters club night for uh, the the London branch, and Mick was uh, was was a special guest at it actually. Oh, was he? Yeah. yeah. Um. So, just when you who was your 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 big influence then with soccer? Because your dad was obviously um GAA. Was he a big influence on that? Uh, and I suppose your coaches uh, and what clubs you were playing at. Yeah, he was huge. Um, you know, he loved he loved watching me play soccer as much as he loved watching me play in Gaelic football or hurling. Um, and probably deep down, he you know he really wanted me to go and play soccer um, out of the tree. So um, he used to come to every game. You know, he used to go kicking around all the time. Um, and obviously, my mum was was a huge influence as well. She actually played a bit of soccer back in the day. Believe it or not, she won. Uh, I think she's a League of Ireland medal with Cork Rangers. So she um she always likes to say that she was the big the big influence in the soccer um <laughs> so yeah and then I had a couple of a couple of good managers growing up Jeremy McGreevy and Pat Holland with uh the Greenwood team so I played with and you know learned a lot from them and um you know Greenwood's a fantastic club located in Toka and uh you know I played with them since I was six I think I was six when I joined them and you know sixteen then moved to Sunderland so it was good to to spend ten years there and. Uh, yeah, a lot of a lot of good influences growing up, I suppose. Yeah, talk talk me then from the move from uh, Greenwood to to Sunderland. What was <coughs> the kind of influence behind you going to Sunderland? Um, I was about fourteen, I'd say, when I was you know getting offers to go on trials with a few clubs. Um, fourteen or fifteen, I think it was might have been fourteen. Um, I played in the Galway Cup with the, one of the Ireland development teams and um, I'd already been on trial to Sunderland and after my first trip there I just knew that I just knew that, that was the kind of place I was going to go because you know I did quite well there and um, the lads who I went with on trial were also kind of you know going to sign there and I kind of had friends there already um, and then after the Galway Cup I went on trial to Blackburn, Leicester and Chelsea um after that tournament and you know even even going to them clubs I just still knew that you know I wanted to go to Sunderland like and I was you know hoping that Sunderland were going to offer me a contract and um I was doing my junior cert then and a few more clubs started ringing you know the house phone and stuff and um my mum would be answering and she'd be kind of saying look you can't be going on too many trials like you got the junior cert coming up you can't be missing the whole year of school so um she said like out, out of the clubs you went to like you obviously like Sunderland so if, you know she was a bit reluctant on me going across before I finished the leaving cert um, whereas my dad was kind of like just just go for it so uh, they came to an agreement anyway in the end um, I went over to Sunderland I think two or three times and then you know we came to an agreement on a contract and um, they agreed that you know they'd sort out the education side of things it wouldn't be my leaving cert but it would be the equivalent in England so um yeah, once all that was kind of tied up, my mum, uh, my mum was happy with it, and we were good to go. Nice. Was was there any um, Irish lads at the at Sunderland at the time? There might have been in the senior team. Yeah, the, the Connor Hurahan was. Um, I think he was two years above me. Um, so when I just went over, when I went over full time, he, he won't like you calling Hurahan. Hurahan. There you go. <laughs> we, we, uh, no, you know what Hurahan means, but. Uh, we um yeah, so he was there. Myler was there as well. He just signed from Cork City, I think, the year before I went over. Um, and then I think John O'Shea came that summer or the next, maybe the next summer. But um, yeah, within a year or two, there was a lot of Irish. And in in my youth team, Patrick McElhinney, uh, me and him went over the same time. And then you had Liam Bagnell, who's from Northern Ireland, and Jordan Watson. Uh, so we had kind of a little click like already moving over so it was it was brilliant for all of us really because we did um we did a lot together and you know it helped it helped me settle in from day one anyway and I'm sure it helped the lads too. Was James Talbot there as well? Yeah Talbot would have came 
probably in my third or fourth year there. Um, I think that's when Talbot came himself and Dan Casey came over. So, oh, yeah. Um, yeah, so to be fair to Sunderland, like there was always a few Irish around. Uh, so it was it was a great place to be. And, you know, from the minute I went there to the minute I left, I, I loved every minute of it. And, you know, obviously there was frustrating times kind of towards the end, not getting a look in and stuff. But, you know, I, I learned a lot from Kevin Ball, the youth team manager. And, you know, if it wasn't for Sunderland, I wouldn't be where, where I am today, I suppose. Yeah, well, just kind of going from that, from, from Sunderland, <clears throat> you had a couple of loan moves and stuff like that. So I suppose taught me from... Sunderland to where you are now, I suppose, um, cr- uh, club wise. So, my first loan move was January 2012, so eight years ago now. Um, we had a reserve game with Sunderland down in Arsenal. We played Arsenal away, and it, we had a good reserve team that year. Um, yeah, we had a few really good players, and Arsenal put a good team out on the day. They had like Chamberlain and few others playing I can't remember but they did a handy team out and uh we beat them 2-0 and we played played really well um and I remember I was on the bus after the game back up to Sunderland and Stephen Clements who was the assistant he just came down to me in the bus and said look there was a Crystal Palace were there watching the game today um you know I don't I don't think they were like there to watch you or whatever but they're really impressed with you and they want you to go on loan um he said like look they've got it they've got a fixture congestion um in January because they're in the cup semi final, so they, you know, they want to be able to rotate the team. So they, he, he just said, look, you're guaranteed two games, um, and then you'll be kind of back up for the rest of the games. And you know, I was just thinking to myself, kind of want to play, you know, every week. But if if I'm guaranteed two games at um a championship level, um, then you know I'll speak to their manager about it and see what he says. So. I rang um, Dougie Friedman, who's manager at the time, and he just explained the whole thing to me um, and said, look, I'd love to have you down here for a month and stuff, play a couple of games, just ex- give you your first exposure to senior football. And it was all good. Martin O'Neill agreed with it. And, you know, it was, it was good for me to, to go down there and um, spent the month down there, played a couple of games, you know, and kind of it, it was probably then when I realised, you know, I can you know I can cope at, at this level anyway. And you know, What age were you then, John? So, I just turned 19, so oh, okay, I so turned yeah. 19 in the October, and then I'd kind of been in a couple of Steve Bruce's last squads before he got sacked, I think he got sacked around November time, and then um, kind of that January, um, I went on loan into the Palace. Okay, and how, how did the loan to Palace go? Um, it was it was good, but obviously I wanted more games, but I knew before I went there I wasn't going to play um, play every week. So I played two games. Um, the first game was an FA Cup game against Derby. We lost 1-0. And then the second game I played was Blackpool away in the championship. And I think we lost last minute 2-1 to Blackpool. Um, but I felt like I did quite well in the games. And, you know, I was happy. And it kind of got to the end of the month. And I remember meeting Dougie Friedman. And he said, like, you just said, look, I'd love you to stay here. As, but you'll be his backup. Um, you know, I, I've got two centre-halves. And I can't guarantee that, that you're going to play many games. So... You know, if you want to go go back to Sunderland and, and train there, or go somewhere else and get more games, then um, you know that's uh, that's your decision. But you know, I'm I'm being really happy with you and stuff. So you know, it was good to hear that. But I just thought to myself, if I'm if I'm just going to be kind of training and stuff and not playing many games, I'm, I'm better off probably going back to Sunderland and training there. Yeah, and and so what happened when you went back to Sunderland? Then were you were you getting in there, or did you go out on loan again? Um, I went back. February and I was just playing reserve games and joining kind of training with the first team you know I was kind of still new to that um you know training with them a lot um but there was kind of there wasn't really any you know opportunities there so you know I didn't really hadn't really kind of had my heart set in anything I was just happy to be training and you know just playing reserve games doing well and and then I remember one day I got a phone call um about Sheffield United uh, my reserve manager rang me he said look Sheffield United um, they want you down there ASAP they've got a game tomorrow and I was I was a bit kind of touchy about it at first because I kind of you know it seemed a bit last minute um, but anyway um, I ended up going down there um, probably looking back it was probably a bit rash but um, you know it was, it was kind of at the time what I thought I had to do and I ended up going down there playing a game and then kind of realised a couple of days after that two of their centre halves one of them was suspended and one of them was carrying an injury so I was kind of thinking I'm in the same boat here as Palace um, 
you know, just going to be training as backup and stuff. And I was, I was a bit disappointed at that because I'd spoken to their manager at the time, Danny Wilson, and he kind of said, like, if you come down and, you know, you, you impress me, you'll play and stuff. But, I, you know, it's football. Like, you, people tell you what, what you want to hear. And, you know, I, I think at that time it, it would have probably been better if, if, if I'd gone somewhere that, you know, I was going to play play more games. But, you know, you live and you learn. Um, so you're probably now, desperate to play Sheffield's there, right? Now. Ah, yeah, you're desperate to play anywhere. Um, especially after the month of Palace, you know, I'd gotten a taste taste for it and I just wanted to get out and play games. And, you know, it's um, it's funny how, uh, you know, <laughs> Sheffield United, I suppose, I was kind of cursing it a bit for a few years after I left and then I ended up coming back here and, you know, having the having the times we've had here. So it's, uh, it's a funny one. It's funny how football works like that, isn't it? Yeah, it's crazy. Yeah, it's crazy. It's good, though. Yeah. So after after the Sheffield United move, um, where what was the situation with yourself then? Um. So I just went back to Sunderland. Um, for the end of the season. Um. Again, playing reserve games, and then unfortunately, my father passed away in April of that year. So um, you know that was devastating. Um, I ended up going home for two or three weeks at the time. You know, for funeral and stuff, and and being at home and. And then just before the end of the season, you know, I just kind of made the decision with the family that I'd go back for a few weeks till the end of the season and just kind of get back to a routine, I suppose. And, um, yeah, get the head right. How that season panned out. Get the head right, yeah, because your head would be messed up and stuff. So um, came back and, you know, played a few games. Um, it was a tough time, to be fair, really tough. But um, I ended up getting my first Ireland under-21 call-up then that summer for the June games, the May and June games. So I suppose in a way for me it was it was keeping busy and kind of you know it was, it was helping me a bit at the time I suppose um, but you know it was still a very hard time for myself and my family. Yeah, I I know from my, losing my father myself how, how hard it can be. Obviously, you do need something to keep you, you know, I suppose taking over or something keeping your mind uh, busy because obviously you can get into a bit of a rut, you know. Yeah, hundred percent. Yeah, and I think that's probably kind of the the reason why I decided to just, you know, get on with life as as quick as possible. Really, even though it was tough. Yeah, well, just kind of from th- that summer. Then was it leading into the next season? Were you still at Sunderland, or did you did you move away that summer? Um, I was still at Sunderland that summer, so I did pre season with the first team, um, and then. In November. What, what year is this, John? Uh, Sorry. This is 2012. Okay. 2012, yeah. So I was kind of, you know, the first couple of games in the Premier League and stuff, I was travelling to the games, you know, sitting in the stands, kind of 19th man and playing reserve games and stuff. And then I got to kind of October and I just, you know, realised it's, it's going to be very difficult to, to get a game. And, you know, I, I do, I've had a taste of going alone and playing, you know, I want to go somewhere where, where I'm going to play. So, um, I had a chat with uh, Martin O'Neill, who was the manager at the time, and said, like, look, I think I think I need to get some games. And he agreed. He said, like, look, go till January and, you know, get as many games in as you can. So I went to Bradford, who were doing well in League Two at the time, and they were in the quarter final of the Cup, I think against Arsenal it was, the year they got to the Cup final. So um ended up going alone there in the November. And the first two or three games, I was loving life, you know, they've, Great stadium, you know, especially for that level. They were getting, you know, over fifteen thousand every week. They were doing well, um, a few good players and stuff. So, you know, I fitted right in, and and then in the fourth game, um, you know, I went up for a header after about twelve minutes and came down and broke my leg. Um, so it was um, it, it it was just like things were starting to, you know, click in, click into gear, and you know, then that happened, and I'm just thinking what's happening to this year like everything just seems to be going south so um that was uh that was a tough one to take but you you, you must have a very strong mentality because you obviously you bounce back from your father's past and then you obviously bounce back from the leg break so um did you have someone kind of helping you out to be that backbone for you like during the, those tough times yeah um i mean when I broke my leg, um, the first thought in my head on the pitch was like, this is it, like, I could be done here. You know, you're looking down at your leg and you see it in half and you're like, whoa, like, how am I ever going to walk again? Um, never mind, play football. 
but then my mom came over she came over then i was in darlington hospital because i did my operation and i did all my rehab with the sunderland um physios and you know the sunderland medical team so i, I was based up there for my operation and you know to be fair for mom she came over for weeks on end um at the start just doing the cooking and stuff and um nothing like an irish and, mammy uh, yeah, uh, exactly. I'd say I put I put a bit of body fat on. I'd say with a few sausages and uh, rations every morning. But um, no, nah, first couple of weeks, especially when I couldn't really do anything, she was great. And uh, yeah, look, it was a it was a long enough road back uh, from that. But um, you know, I'm I'm happy to say I got over that and uh, you know managed to get back playing. When you when you got back then, um, because you were at loan at, at Bradford, am I right in saying that? Yeah. So you came back to Sunderland, was it again? Obviously, you were going through your rehab yeah. and, and whatnot. Yeah, yeah, I came back to Sunderland and I did my rehab um, with Dave Binningsley, who was kind of the main physio who took it. Uh, he was brilliant, you know, he's a really good friend to this day. And he, I think I started my rehab that kind of November, December, and I was back on the pitch for the reserves the following September. So I think I had about four operations um i had a couple operations early on and then like the screws weren't or the the bone wasn't quite healing because like i was expected to be back kind of june july time but you know it came to may and i was out trying to run and it was still sore and went for an x-ray they said it wasn't healing properly so they had to do another operation um so that kind of set me back a few months and then i got back playing i suppose october wise i was back training and, and playing games for the reserve so it was um roughly a year probably a year till I kind of got back to feeling anyway, like myself. And how is that like, so for, for example, for anyone, I suppose, young lads who are, who have broken their leg or anything, would you have any advice for them for, um, you know, getting back to rehab or just keeping their heads st- straight during that time? Cause it can be, I can imagine it can be a very demoralizing time. Yeah, it's very, very demoralizing, especially when you know at the start, you're going to be up for a long time. Um, the way I did it really was just set small goals, like um, something simple as, you know, trying to bend your knee a little bit more, you know, every every week or two. Um, you know, maybe in three weeks I'll be able to to, to walk or to run. Um, things like that, setting small goals. Um, and just trying to just trying to keep positive. Um, just keep thinking every day that, you know, you'll get back to what you were before. And, you know, if, if, if anyone is unfortunate for, for anything like that to happen, then, then just, you know, just stay positive and keep setting small goals for yourself. It's obviously good to have a good kind of infrastructure around you as well. As you say, your your mom or your family or partner or something, it's always good to have around. Um, but going on from there, um, when you got back play, what was the first game back like for yourself? Were you buzzing? Yeah. Um, yeah, I was buzzing, but I, it was quite weird. Like, I just, you know, you're kind of, it's your first game in a long time and, you know, even the leg kind of isn't used to it. And um, it's uh, it's a bit weird. You, you're kind of flying for the first 10 minutes and then you hit a brick wall and you're blowing then till half time and then you come out after half time and, you know, you're kind of, you, you know, you're only playing till 60 minutes or whatever. So you're, you're just getting through it. But probably took about three or four days to get the, the stiffness out of the body after that one. Um but uh, yeah, I had, a, I had a good couple of months training, kind of before I I played kind of ninety minutes and stuff. So I was I was took me about I'd say it took me about three months of games probably to kind of get back to feeling how I used to feel. Would you be a bit hesitant for tackles because you're 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 kind of known for a bit kind of throwing your body on the line for challenges and stuff like that? I, I wouldn't imagine you were doing that the first game back, were you? Um, I don't know. It didn't really click into my head because when I when I um had the operation, they put a metal rod into it, and the surgeon said like your leg is stronger now than it'll ever be. Like it's got a metal rod in it, so I think that just stuck with me. Like, and I just felt like I had a I had a metal leg. So um, you know, <laughs> I was just back to back to usual, throwing my body in front of everything. Yeah, well, as good defenders do. Um, talk me then going on from that. Uh, were you still you're still at Sunderland at this stage? Uh, still at Sunderland, yeah. Um, went on loan to Southend in the February two thousand and fourteen, and you know that was that was an unbelievable uh, loan move for me because I, you know, I hadn't played a played a proper game since the time at Bradford, which was November twenty twelve. So it was kind of a year and a half later, going on loan to Southend, who were you know fighting for the playoffs in League Two. Uh, Phil Brown was the manager at the time. 
and um, I went down there, uh, did really well. We got to the playoffs. Uh, we lost the semi final to Burton, um, but you know I played fifteen fifteen odd games, um, and I think that's when I kind of started feeling like I was getting you know really getting back to myself. Yeah, so you'd have been what twenty one. Uh, 21, yeah. I was 21 at the time. Um, and then towards the end of the South End loan spell, um, I got a call from uh, the Sunderland um, kind of reserve team manager saying, you know, I think the manager at the time was Gus Pyatt. And since I came back um, from the broken leg, I hadn't trained with the first team once. So I kind of knew, you know, my contract was coming up. I knew it wasn't going to be extended. So I got a call saying, look, your contract's not going to be extended. Um you know, if you want to start talking to other clubs or, you know, sign for someone else, then, you know, you're free to do so. And at the time, you know, I was kind of thinking, you know, um, obviously you're a bit gutted, like you're thinking, well, I want to wanna break into Sunderland's team. But, you know, at the time, I just I just thought, look, I'll show them and um, I'm confident I can I can get where I want to get. And, you know, I um, spoke to my agent and stuff. And in the summer then, I ended up signing for Gillingham um, on a two-year deal. So it's you know, it was it was kind of a quick a quick transition, really. Did you find that difficult? Because obviously you were at Sunderland from I think you said fourteen. Um, so was that was that difficult? Because obviously you were with them. I don't know what's that eight years or or something I moved, like that. I, uh, I, moved, I, I moved I moved over at sixteen. Six so I was there from I was there from two thousand nine to two thousand fourteen. So five years. Oh five. Okay. All right. So moving on from. Uh, from Gillingham then, or sorry, to Gillingham. Um, how was that move for you? It was nice to be at a club uh, that was I suppose wanted you, was it? Ah, uh, yeah, it was brilliant. Um, Peter Taylor was the manager, and look, I just went down to meet him in the summer, and he said, um, he said, look, I I really like you as a player. Um, you know, if if you do well, you'll play every game for me. Um, do you know, I have a lot of belief in you and. You know, I, I see you doing doing very well here and um I'd love you to sign. Um so basically I, I had a couple of meetings with other clubs kinda of lined up, but I, I just had a good feeling after the, the meeting and I just said to my agent, like, yeah, I wanna sign here. If I'm gonna play, um then I, I know I'll impress people, so you know, get it done. So basically signed a two year deal and the next day I was training. Yeah, you see you seem to have a really good mentality in that regard. Like I I I'd say a lot of players probably would have went the other way and kind of been like sulked the fact that they were going to let go of your club or whatever. But from what you're saying to me here now, it seems like you're the polar opposite. Whereas you have that mentality as if to say, right, well, you don't think I'm good enough. I'm gonna gonna show you. Yeah, um, I suppose it just comes from having belief in yourself. Um, you know, I, I've always had belief in myself. I've always, um, you know, thought that uh, I can do well and. You know, going to Gillingham, people who are kind of, even kind of my friends and stuff probably thought it was a, a step back. But, you know, I saw it as a huge step forward. Um, I was going from kind of playing playing reserve games in, in at Sunderland to, obviously, I got went on loan to South End. But then, you know, I was moving up a league again to League One um, to, you know, a decent club in League One. And I was, I seen it as a big step forward and a chance to, to try and start proving myself week in, week out. And, you know, that's that's what happened. And how did the, your time at Gillingham go? Oh, it was fantastic. Um, first year, we, I think we finished mid-table. Uh, Peter Taylor got sacked in December and Justin Edinburgh came in, um, Lord Mercia. Um, he came in, in in the January and we had a brilliant end of the season and then we kind of took that form into the following season and um, we, we, we think we were top two, top three for the whole whole season up until February and we had a few injuries that kind of that hampered us, um, and we filtered out. And by the time the injuries kind of came, came at a really bad time. Um, you know, we were struggling for form, and we slipped out of the playoffs altogether. But you know, the the two years, especially the second year, was was brilliant because we were winning winning more games than than not in the second year. And you know, I made some great friends there, and um, obviously got my move to Brentford off the back of it. Yeah. Uh, what was the what was it like going from Gillingham then? Were you sad to leave them to go to Brentford? Um, yeah, it's it's always hard leaving a place you build up a connection with the fans and stuff. But um, 
I was more excited about about joining Brentford, I suppose, um, because it was you know in the championship, um, you know, really well run club, um, you know, good players, good manager, um, you know, another test, you know, another step in the ladder, and um, you know, I was, you know, I was really happy to that they came in for me, and you know, really happy to sign for them. But it was always it was always sad leaving Gillingham too because. You know, I captained the team a lot in my second year, and I had a good relationship with the fans and and the manager. So, um, yeah, it was it was kind of a bit of boat really, but I was you know I was really excited to join Brentford. Yeah, was Scott Hogan at uh, Brentford at the time you joined? Yeah, he was there. Yeah, he was in my first season at Brentford. He was flying, um, and that's when he got his move to Villa then in the January. So, uh, yeah, he was he was banging him in for the first few months when I was there. Yeah, you actually well, you've you've been teammates with him again since obviously last season. Um, great to see him flying yeah. again. Oh yeah. So talk to me about uh, Brentford and you know signing for them. You were saying there about the the structure and the setup was was fantastic. So, um, talk to me about your time there. I had a really good two years at Brentford. Um, my first year, obviously signed um, under Dean Smith. Um, you know, who, who put a good bit of faith in me at the start. Um, you know, I came in and, and started the, the majority of the league games in, in my first season there. And, you know, we Brentford are kind of renowned for having really, really good attacking players and stuff. So it was, for me, going in there, um, seeing how technical the, the players were, you know, brought me on heaps and bounds. Um, you know, it was a team that wants to, wants to play football, play from the back and, you know, play... play um, play kind of the, the way kind of Man City and stuff play. It's a team that kind of tries to, to play good football. So for me, um, it improved me a lot. Um, Dean Smith, you know, he, he's a good coach and a good manager and, you know, used to be a centre-half himself. So he, he brought me on heaps and bounds. And, um, you know, I can't, I can't talk highly enough for Brentford, the way they, the way they run the club, the players they sign. Um, you know, they sign really good players with really good, um, you know, technical ability and, you know, you can see their their success in the transfer market. The they buy players in for kind of cheap, and and then they sell them on for millions. So um, yeah, it's it's brilliant what they have done, and you know what what they're still doing. To be fair, and you know, I, I became captain in my second season, um, which was which was a big honour, and um, yeah, it was a fantastic club. So what what was it like then? Was that your first club you were a captain at? Yeah, first club I was um, made captain at, so it was it was brilliant. Um, we had a really good captain in my first year, Harley Dean, and he moved to Birmingham um, in the summer of 2017. So, um, you know, um, the manager pulled me and said, look, I'd like you to be captain this year. And, you know, it was it was great. You know, it was a great boost for myself. And, you know, to, to be thought of like that was brilliant. And, you know, we I think we finished ninth at the end of the season. So we were kind of maybe six or seven points off the playoffs um, and uh, we didn't quite make the playoffs but you know we had a good team and you know we had some good players who you know who have kicked on since yeah was was this the first season or the second season that, that you're that was the second season oh sorry so you got the move to Sheffield United off the back of that season yeah so in um, in the summer um, Sheffield United obviously came in for me and you know it took a while to get done obviously Brentford weren't you know mad keen to sell me at the time and I suppose just seeing the belief that kind of I heard Sheffield United wanted me you know desperately kind of made me made me want to make the move and you know I knew how good Sheffield United were um from the previous season playing against them and um, they were the toughest team that I played against that season and you know as soon as I knew that they were mad for me um you know kind of you know turned my head a bit and you know I was obviously delighted to, to get the move done in the end. Was it, were you a bit hesitant because I know you'd been there before? Um, no, not in that sense. Um, I suppose it was kind of tough leaving Brentford somewhere. You're captain, you get on with everyone. You know, you've a lot of friends, and um, you know, you're you're really enjoying it. You know, really, really like living in London and stuff. And but I think you know, and for me, um, football was, um, you know, I just I just had a good feeling about it. Um, you know, another. The manager, you know, Chris Wilder, when when he when he came in for me, you know, I could just kind of tell that, you know, they they really wanted me, and um, you know, that's as a footballer, that's all you want to do, you know, you want to go somewhere where you're wanted and valued, and you know, somebody's gonna believe in you as much as you believe in yourself, and 
you know, just felt like um, felt like I, I had that, and you know, that's why I kind of was mad to get the move done. Yeah, well, you you were um, the record signing there, weren't you? Because I actually met you that summer uh, yeah, in Bradman Lane. You were yeah, you, you were in the you. hotel. Yeah, I met you a few weeks after. Yeah, with Noel, the backballers. Yeah, shout out, shout out to Noel. Uh, shout out, Noel Marshall. Uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, get the backballers in. But um, yeah, so we had a good chat that day. That was probably a few weeks after I signed there. So I was still living in the hotel. Um, but uh, yeah, what a season, man. The, the first season there was just... Thing yeah, talk, really, talk, talk, talk to me through it. The whole way through it. Talk to me. Because I know you love talking yeah, got, about it. Oh uh, yeah, we got off to a horrendous start. Um, lost to Swansea in my first game. And then in my second game, we lost 3-0 away to Middlesbrough. And I think everybody in Sheffield was trying to dig out the the receipt from uh, the purchase of John Egan, I'd say, to, to try and send him back to Brentford. <laughs> but um, <laughs> no, we uh, we got it together then and we won the next four or five games. Um, and yeah, I just had a, I don't know, we played into Milan in the pre-season and we did quite well against them. We drew 1-1. And I just remember thinking, you know, this we have a good team, like, you know, did he'd signed and... Yeah, we just I just felt like things were coming together and then after the first couple of games we signed Ollie Norwood and his quality was just so evident the minute he walked into the place, just lifted the whole place. Um and yeah, the team just started clicking into gear and you know, we, we think we were top of the league in October, we were on the top the whole season and you know, then we kind of ended up hunting down leads after Christmas. We we fell out of the top two and Hunted them down and yeah, it was just the, the season of dreams really. Um, could not have gone any better and you know probably couldn't have done it with a better bunch of lads as well. The team is so close there and all the lads are, are just as close off the pitch as they are on it and I think that shows because you know we, we fight for each other. Yeah, I, I, when did Ender sign? Did he sign the same summer as you? I think he signed the summer before me. I think he was there a year before I was there. Um. Because we played Sheffield United my first game of that season with Brentford. I think that was his first game for Sheffield United. So he was there a year before me. Oh, okay. I, I, I for some reason, thought that you were there. Um, I just came the summer together. But uh, you, yeah. obviously, coming to the back end, Scott Hogan came in January. So you had, obviously, an Irish uh, teammate with Enda. And you had uh, Didzy as well. That must have been nice, obviously, having all the lads there. And then you would have been in, in and out of squads then as well, wouldn't you? Yeah, it was class. Um, you know, having the Irish boys there and stuff, and then we'd we'd go away and we'd all go away together, kind of meeting up with the Ireland team together. So we had our little kind of bladesman click. Uh, it was funny, but uh, yeah, it was it was a highly um, tense time this time last year. Uh, playing, you know, playing every week as if your life depends on it because you know it was kind of Norwich were kind of ahead of us in Leeds and. It was like one week we'd we'd win and Leeds would lose, and then the next week Leeds would win and we'd lose, and it was kind of back and forth for ages. Um, so we had uh, myself and Endo, we had a few tense kind of coffees and stuff the odd day and the odd mornings, the odd Monday mornings after a game on a Saturday, um, just absolutely stressed out of our heads uh, for about two or three months. Um, so it's it's funny to look back on it now, but you know at the time when you kind of lose a game and they win one, you think it's, it's the end of the world. Um, but then you win one and, and they lose one and you're thinking, oh, we're, you know, we're back on track. So, uh, yeah, it's, uh, it was fantastic to, to get the job done in the end and, you know, to go up automatically was brilliant because, uh, you know, we, we worked so hard for it. Yeah, the celebrations look, look quality and obviously that video uh, that you got started uh, went viral. Um, <laughs> yeah. what, was, what was the maker behind it? Obviously, we know the, uh, the LA, LA, LA song, but uh, it was very well taught, I, I thought. And very catchy as well. Yeah, I remember I was watching uh I was watching a video on my phone, I think that January. And um I think it was the Trench Cup, some team from from I don't know where they were from. Might have been from Northern Ireland or something. And they won the Trench Cup and I remember seeing they sang an LA song on the bus, but they they'd obviously made the words about their team. I seen it on Twitter or something. I remember saying to my girlfriend, they said like I'm going to make a song here, like, because, you know, I think we're going to go up this season and um, I'm going to make a song about about the boys, like, and she was kind of saying, kind of looked at me and laughed and thought nothing of it. So then, um, obviously, in my head, I thought about it in about 10 or 20 minutes, like, I had it all made up and this was, like, January. And I was over at my friend's house then in the 
in the March, I think it was, and um, I was having a couple of drinks with him and his gaff um, with dinner or whatever, and uh, we were just chatting away. And then I remember I sang it to him for banter, like, um, <laughs> and he was like, "Oh my God, you got to sing that, whatever." So thought nothing of it again. Obviously worried about getting up, and then we actually got promoted, and we were at the Player of the Year do, and. Um, obviously highly intoxicated we got promoted the day before <laughs> so we were uh we were uh we were on the beer kind of all day um after the villa leeds game which meant that we were up so we were in the stadium all day having a few points or whatever and uh that night at the player year was sitting next to george baldock so i um i quickly taught him like and then uh you know got ushered onto the stage you know he went up onto the stage and called me up and stuff so i went up i called everyone up and then uh obviously belted it out and the next morning, I remember just like flipping over my phone to see what time it was, and the thing was about to blow up. There was just messages everywhere, and I just remember turning it over and putting my putting the quilt <laughs> over my head, thinking, "What have I done here?" Like getting the fear those flashbacks. Yeah, getting the fear massively. But no, it was it, it went absolutely viral. Then we played Stoke the following weekend, and for the whole game, the fans just sang it. Uh, it was the last game of the season, and. It was mental how, how quick it took off, really. But um, nah, it's it's great to have that memory now. You know, the odd day you might be thinking about the the promotion, you just flick back to YouTube and type it in, and it's funny to look back at. It's quality though, it was well well thought of. So fair play to you for that. Ah, uh, yeah, it was good. It was good. Um, well, before we talk about obviously the Premier League, I wanted to talk to you about Ireland. Um, because I think Mick came in. Mick McCarthy, uh, November, a year, a year and a, a couple of months ago. Um, I remember I was over at the the Wales game where we lost 4-1. You were on the bench. Um, you had number 10 for some reason. What was that? Uh, we won't yeah. go into the results. But what was the number yeah. 10 about? Was that any particular reason? Uh, I don't have a clue. Um, Dick Redmond, the kit man, is responsible for that. Uh, I remember I wore the number ten against Poland, and um, it's a, I was playing centre half wearing the number ten. But looking at it now, it's really cool to have the the number ten upstairs, like tucked away, because you know you grew up with Ireland, and you know you're seeing Robbie Keane in the number ten, and you're thinking, "Geez, I'd love to wear that number ten someday." And obviously, being a centre half, you never think it's it's going to happen. But you know, it was, it was it was weird to get it, but it was funny at the same time. And I've got a few um, when I was on the bench and didn't get on. I was number ten a few times, like you said in that game. But it was funny then because I said to I said to Dick the kit man. I remember uh, there was a game coming up, and it was after I'd worn the ten, and I said like, "Look, Dick, like I'm a centre half. You know, don't don't make me like change the number ten, give number ten to to like a striker or something like that." And, William uh, Gallas. So he said that. Yeah, so he said, that's fine, that's fine. So he went away anyway, and he came, I remember, I'll never forget, he came down the corridor and he said, oh, don't worry, I've got the number sorted for you. And I goes, oh, really, what number am I now? And he goes, you're number seven, dead serious. And I was like, are you serious? Yeah. <laughs> he just changed me from a number 10 to a right winger, and I was sent to half. Like I was saying to him, give me number, fake, give me number 20 or something. Um, but it was funny, like, I think, uh, I think Robbie Brady... Did you wear, did you wear seven? Thing. I I don't know. I don't know if he changed it again to fifteen or something after that. Because I said, look, fourteen or fifteen or something like just <laughs> give me a give me a number where people aren't going to fall off their seat if they see me wearing it. Just for banter, like because Robbie was Robbie would have been injured at the time, and he's usually number ten. Um, Robbie Brady, yeah. I think he got yeah, and I, I'm sure Duffy wore the seven one time, and I think mad numbers got thrown around. He did. Wear, he did wear number seven. I think. Oh, when did, I think he wore it in qualifying. Yeah, it was goes, some, some, yeah, some horrendous. Because I remember uh, he said it to me. I remember yeah, he said I it to me. He said I, when I was wearing a ten. I remember he said it to me. I wore a seven and four, and I was thinking <laughs> something going wrong here with the numbers. But it was it's funny to look back on it now. Yeah, bending in free kicks and all that. Yeah, <laughs> I think they were expecting me to do a few step overs as soon as they put the ten on and start dribbling, dribbling around the place. But uh, nah, <laughs> didn't work. <laughs> Well, just kind of talk to me about the campaign. Obviously, um, circumstances with Richard Kyo meant that you came in. But I felt as though you took your chance. And I'd say now, between yourself and Shane Duffy, you're, you're probably the, the go-to centre-backs now. Um, so what was it like? Because obviously, we're after going through your career so far. You had injuries. You had all this kind of uh, setbacks. 
did you ever think that you were going to get to that level of Premier League and, you know, first choice Ireland centre back? You might not say it, but I'm going to say. Um, I think out of pure stubbornness, you know, I, I, you know, I always had the belief that I would kind of do well, and you know, they were my goals. Um, you know, I'm not going to shirk away from that. They were kind of they're your two biggest goals is to play for your country and to play in the Premier League, and um. You know, to there's a lot of people in Ireland who would give their right hand, you know, just to play one minute for the for the national team. And you know, anytime you're kind of called up to the Ireland team, it's it's kind of a proud moment to see your name in the squad. And um, you know, to go and meet up with the lads, it's it's brilliant. And you know, my first squad was in 2017, and um, you know, ever since kind of my first squad, I've been in a few squads now, and you know, every time I've gone away, I've loved it. And, um, obviously it's a lot better when, when you're playing but you know sometimes you got to bide your time and lucky enough I got you know kind of biding my time and got to play a few friendlies and then got to, to start my first qualifier against George and um, you know it wasn't to be against uh, Switzerland and Denmark but we were obviously looking forward to the, the playoff this, this week but you know they, whenever they're on you know I just can't wait to, to get back to it really and meet up the lads again yeah, what what's Mick been like with you? Because obviously he was a centre back as well, and you've you've spoken about having centre halves as managers. But what was he like with you? Yeah, he seems to really like you. Yeah, he's been good. Um, you know, it's uh, he made me captain for the Bulgaria game, which was you know brilliant for me, huge honour, and you know um, got a lot to thank him for that. And you know then you know threw me in against uh, you know Georgia, Switzerland, and Denmark, and. You know, I think uh, it's good to, to earn the trust of a manager and, you know, I've kind of been biding my time all year, you know, just hoping I get a chance and, you know, hopefully know that, uh, you know, I've took it and I can I can keep taking keep taking my chances when I get them. Well, you have for me in, in Road to Glory, to be fair. You've got me to the final so far, so yeah. keep up the good work in that regard. Uh, hopefully we'll win it. Hopefully, hopefully. Um, but just on, on uh, obviously we've gone through the campaign, but, you know, people... A lot of people um, are very excited with the youth coming through. Now, you would have trained with uh, Troy, uh, Michael Obafemi, Aaron Connolly, uh, Lee O'Connor as well. Um, what are your thoughts on the kind of the younger lads coming through? Do you think that maybe, I know the Euros are going to be pushed back uh, a year, but do you think some of those boys might be able to make the jump up? Some of them are playing championship football. Now, obviously, you were playing that last year. Um, but have you been impressed by the majority of them? Yeah, there's there seems to be fantastic talent coming through at the moment, um, and it's brilliant. It's brilliant for the country, um, and it's brilliant for the lads themselves. But you know, football is a you know it's 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 a tale of the unexpected, and you know who knows what might happen. Twelve months is a long time in football, um, so yeah, I'm sure them lads will be you know trying to kick on in their own careers and you know trying to to keep playing and keep playing well and you know the main thing is is you know if if we've got good players coming through then it's brilliant for the country it's brilliant for the team and you know it, it's brilliant for the competition for the squads and and the starting 11 so yeah um it's fantastic to see such such good players coming through now and you know hopefully they can keep getting better and keep kicking on yeah um speaking of uh youth and that you've recently started your own academy so how is how did that come about and uh, how's that going? Uh basically my old club Greenwood, um, in Toker, they in Cork, they uh, they just came to me with the idea. They said, Look, we we kinda wanna revamp the whole academy like and we'd love to to put it under your name as obviously you spent a long time here and you know, are, are you okay with that? Are you okay to jump on board? And I said, Yeah, look, that's that's brilliant. Uh you know, it's brilliant for me to, to be able to try and give a bit back to the young lads from where I'm from and you know, I haven't been able to make it make it back for a session yet because it only started in September. But you know, I've got a couple of buddies helping out with the coaching. You know, doing coaching every Monday nights, and you know, it's it, it's class to to go back and see. You know, there'd be eighty, a hundred odd kids some nights up there. You know, kicking ball, and you know, it's um it's weird in a way because you're kind of thinking I was that kid there about you know twelve or thirteen, I suppose sixteen years ago, and. Um, now there's kids, you know, wearing a Greenwood badge with the John Egan Academy sign around it, so it's uh, it's a bit surreal. But uh, no, it's good, and you know, any time I can go back and you know give a bit back to Greenwood and give a bit back to the community, then it's it's brilliant. And for anyone watching, uh, looking to join your academy, how would they go about doing it? Because we'll put some links in there for you. 
basically just get in touch with um greenwood um they have a facebook page they have an instagram page um kind of just about the john egan academy really and you know if anyone fancies it it's usually on monday nights um up in uh, the bears ga club on on the astro and um yeah it's, it's fantastic it's it's got great feedback so far and you know the kids love it which is the main thing and you know, hopefully we can, uh, you know, we can keep it going now and, you know, hopefully it can, it can get better and better. Yeah. Speaking of that, uh, getting better and better. Talk to me about this season with Sheffield United. It's, um, did you expect it to go so well? I think you, I think only Liverpool and Burnley have more clean sheets than you this season. Am I right in saying that? Yeah, no, it's gone, um, it's gone brilliant so far. Obviously it's, it's called to a halt now, but, we were quite confident, but we were kind of going into the unknown at the start of the season. But we we seemed to take to it really well, and I think after about five or six games, we really started taking the handbrake off and playing like we kind of played in the championship and going after teams after kind of a tentative first five games where we we're kind of feeling feeling the division out. Um, but you know every player has kicked on and every player has improved and brought their game to to new heights and. It definitely shows on the pitch. Um, you know, we've been more than a match for, for any team, well, most teams in the league so far. And um, the clean sheet record is one I, I'm really proud of because as a defender, clean sheets are your bread and butter. And, you know, to be two points off fifth with a game in hand um, after nearly 30 games, you know, it shows how well we've done really. And um, I suppose I suppose we probably didn't think it would have gone as well as it has, but we always had the belief that, you know, if we take it game by game, we'll see what happens. And, you know the manager is a is a huge driving force behind that, and you know he's he's an unbelievable manager, and he gets, he gets the best out of us week in week out, day in day out, and you know he's he's got a huge part to play. What's Chris Wilder like as as a person? He seems he seems like a good lad. Ah, uh, he's he's brilliant. Um, you know he's for me personally he's been unbelievable. Um been the biggest influence on my professional career so far um you know the faith he put in me from day one when i came to the club you know even after the first couple of games where we lost and you know i probably didn't play play that well you know he stood by me and he just said you know keep it going you know i got a lot of you know i think highly of you and wouldn't have brought you here otherwise and stuff and my game has just gone from strength to strength um under him himself and alan nil the the assistant manager and I think this year now as well, it's even it's even kicked on another gear. And um, as a manager, he, he gets the best out of you every day. You know, if, if you're having an off day in training, if someone isn't running around, you know, whistle goes. You're into the into the centre circle, and you know it's a, a bit of a telling off. Like get get your act together, lads. If we don't do it today, then we won't do it Saturday. And you know, you, you, it shines through on a on a weekend. Um, every game we're in we're in practically every game you know we've got a chance of, of getting a result and it's because we just kind of we work hard and you know we that, that all stems from the work we do in the training room with the manager and the coaches so um yeah to to come up from the championship and and, and do what we're doing is tough um you know if you look at Villa and Norwich they, they've kind of you know come up and you know they're in a relegation battle all year and everyone thought you know that we were odds on to go down and we'd be down there with them and for us to come up and kind of eclipse the kind of relegation battle and then be pushing for Europe, um, you know, just show us how, how well we have them. So you, you have to put into perspective, like it, it's a really tough league and it's probably the hardest league in the world. So, um, you know, yeah, we're, we're, we're very happy with what we're doing, but uh, no doubt the, we, we all want more because that's the way we are and that's the way the manager is. Well, I think that shows as well, because you look at, um, you mentioned Didzy already, um, you know, it's obviously well documented. He didn't have a club. Uh, he came in. He ended up getting Player of the Year. Um, he's been. He's now Ireland's um, main striker, I suppose you could say. Well, he has been for the campaign. Um, and then obviously yourself and the um, Callum Robinson to a degree as well. Um, you've all been a, a a big part of this campaign. And obviously with Sheffield United now, you seem to be because these are all there together. I know Callum's just gone on loan to West Brom, but you seem to uh, be the the biggest part of the team now when people look at the Irish team they go oh well the lads playing for Sheffield United they're, they're fifth they have to be in the squad that's what, the way I think most fans look at um, Sheffield United now which is credit to yourselves uh, well it's good to you know it's good to be doing well um, and for for the Ireland team it's good to have you know four players um, playing in the Premier League 
first and foremost. Um, obviously, with the same team is brilliant, but you know the fact that we got promoted and we're exposed to a higher level is only going to bring us on as players. Um, so it's brilliant, and it's the more Irish players we we kind of have playing in the Premier League is it's fantastic for the for the the Ireland team. So yeah, it's first and foremost, you know, it's 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 your kind of it's your day and day out bread and butter to to do well for your club and. You know, then hopefully things things will follow it with the Ireland team because you know you only meet up a few times a year. But you know, if you can get your head down and and do well at club level, then you know that that recognition tends to follow. Yeah. Um. But the the thing about uh, the Ireland team is, it's always seem to have a a very good connection. Like all the lads seem to get on very well. Now, obviously, I'm not in the camp to know that, but from seeing around, seniors around, whatever. Talk to me a bit about your bromance with uh, Ender Stevens and how that came about. <laughs> yeah, sure. Obviously, the the Sheffield United connection, but I always get on well with it. To be fair, in the couple of squads I was in with him before I went to Sheffield United, but no, um, the last good few camps, I think most of this campaign we've been rooming together. Um, so it's funny. It's uh, he, he's good crack. He's uh, we compliment each other well. I'd say. Um, <laughs> but yeah, we've uh, we've good banter, and to be fair, in Sheffield we we meet up a lot for coffee and stuff after training as well. So spend a good good bit of time together. Um, but yeah, it's good. I think you know we've we've a really close team with the Ireland team as well, and you know all the lads are sound out, and uh, it's 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 an enjoyable kind of environment to be in. Um, you know you got a few jokers, and you know I've, it's it's good crack. Yeah, because it it and I I think as well. Um, having that with yourself and end obviously playing at Ireland obviously helps then as well playing a club being so good friends boys you know on, on the pitch that will help us as well going forward yeah definitely um, you know I'm, I'm I'm lucky to be a part of a club team Sheffield United where it's like that where it's you know really close knit and kind of sense a sense of pride about who you're playing for and you know it goes without saying being with Ireland is is the proudest thing ever for any Irishman, and you can see that when you meet up. You know, all the boys are just buzzing to to be together, and the crack is the crack is good. And you know, on the pitch, the work is tough, and training we train hard. And then it comes to a game, you know, and everyone's going out there willing to do anything to win the game. So um, yeah, I'm I'm really lucky to be part of two great squads at the moment, and uh, it's it's it always helps when you're tightening it off the pitch. Um, you know, it always helps on the pitch. Yeah, well, just um, what while I have you here, I'll be interested to know because obviously this is your first year in the Premier League. But who's the toughest uh, person you've came up against this season? Um, I suppose De Bruyne or Mane. It's uh, different players, like, but they're probably the two I've been most, most, um, most impressed, impressed. with as a striker. Yeah, most impressive. As a striker, I'd say the fella from Wolves was good. Um, Raul Jimenez. Jimenez. He was, yeah, he was handy. Um, but I'd say probably overall player, probably De Bruyne or Mane, one of them. They were, uh, to be honest, as you could name a lot of players like this. You got yeah, but know, other players. I think the, I think the two but, you mentioned there. Yeah. Yeah, the elite at the moment. Anyway. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. <laughs> Um, right, well, I just want to finish off with two fine questions and I'll, I'll let you go because so, I've kept you for an o- over an hour. So I appreciate your time. Um, oh, you're all right, but so. Time flies, lad. Hi, my name is Reese. I am six years old. I'm from Warford and I'm a big fan of the Wars. And my two questions are what two players would you like to self isolate with and what should what do you think should your FIFA twenty one rating be? Thanks, thanks, John. Hi, Reese. Um, thanks a lot for your message, pal. Uh, I'm going to answer your questions now. The first one, the two two players I'd like to self isolate. Um, I'll probably go for. End as number one because when we're away with Ireland, we're we're like we're in self isolation anyway in the hotel. Um, so I'll go with him as number one, and I'll say Jack Byrne number two because he comes down to our room quite a bit uh, for a bit of banter, um, <laughs> and the banter is the banter is usually good with uh with Jack around. So um, yeah, I'll have to say them two dubs uh, and then Jack. Yeah, 
Do you have any funny stories of them too that are uh, able to be <laughs> on air? I don't think so. <laughs> okay, no hassle. No, Jack is uh, Jack is some man for a joke. Like his jokes, are unbelievable. Uh, he's a, he's a good man. Oh, man. Very good man. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so Reese's second question was, uh, what do you think your FIFA twenty one um, rating should be? Mm, I think. Mm, FIFA 21 rating I'd say um, I'd take a 99 if they offer it to me like uh, <laughs> but, uh, I'd say I'd be customising that one but no I think I think I'm around the 70s now 70 I don't know what I'm 77 I think take, uh, 77 is it so I'd take, I'd take I a 78 so. but if I, if I could nick into an 80 I'd be buzzing with that so you might as well round it off John uh, you may as well round, round up. I'll round up to 80. Hopefully, you can nick an 80 next year. <laughs> <laughs> well, there you are, Reese. That's your question answered. Now, Reese is only six years yeah. old, but apparently, he's a huge fan of yours. Uh, thanks a lot, Reese. Good man. Um, and secondly, then. Uh... Right, John. Who are your favourite centre backs of all time? Favourite Irish centre backs of all time? And favourite Premier League centre backs of all time? Also, please join Arsenal. Thanks for your message and your questions. Uh, I suppose two Irish centre halves I'll pick. I'll probably go with Paul McGrath number one because I was kind of rared getting told about Paul McGrath. You know how good he was, and you know trying to watch old clips and stuff of him. Um, yeah, so I'll probably have to have to say him number one. And then kind of my childhood um, and kind of growing up, Richard Dunn was. Um, was a brick wall, so yeah, I'll, I'll say uh, you know them two are probably the two that um you know stick out in my mind, uh, Richard Dunn and, and Paul McGrath. They actually got into our all time eleven, and we got a bit Did of stick they, for yeah? them. But I'm glad, I'm glad you, I'm glad you chose them anyway. But uh, I think he wants yeah. to know your your Premier League or yeah Premier League centre backs then of all time. Premier League, um, I have to say Nemanja Vidic number one. Uh, he was uh he was unbelievable for United and I supported United growing up and stuff. So yeah, he's he's got to go in as number one. And um number two, John Terry, great player, you know, great centre half. Um I was gonna I was thinking in my probably. head you were gonna say J T yeah. because you could be a play kind of similar to him. From when I was younger, yeah, to be fair. Um Jeez, if I half a good as career as him, you'd be you you take it like how many Premier Leagues and stuff as he won. But no, them two, John Terry and Vidic, I'd have watched a lot of um, you know, growing up and when I kinda of moved to England just watching clips and stuff. Yeah, I'd probably say them two for my uh for my Premier League centre backs and Richard Dunn and Paul McGrath for, you know, the two two Irish centre backs. Yeah, they would wouldn't uh, wouldn't do too badly with them for in the in the fence, uh even if it's had nah, two as subs. Yeah. No, you wouldn't be conceding many goals in here. No. Um, he also asked if you'd join Arsenal, but I don't think uh, you want to be doing that right now. <laughs> no. Nah. I'll be joining my uh, be joining my PlayStation then on a minute for a game of FIFA, I'd say. Isolation. All right. Well, that has to be done. I have to go play the uh, Road to Glory final against Spain, so hopefully you uh, do me justice yeah. and get me a clean sheet. Um, huge thanks for coming on John uh, really appreciate your time and uh, it's been a great chat um, just wanted to say to anyone who's watching that may, may be new to the channel or whatever drop a like uh, drop a subscribe leave your comments uh, leave your thoughts sorry, in the comments and uh, as I said huge thanks to John for, for coming on uh, absolute pleasure top man Paul thanks a million bye take no it worries. easy